The morning of January 5, 1942, was cold and bleak. A piercing wind walked along deserted Church Street. That afternoon, I left for duty in the U.S. Marine Corps. The war with Japan had been going on for less than four weeks. Wake Island had fallen. Pearl Harbor was a real tragedy, a bitter, searing humiliation. Hastily composed war songs were sung by everyone from small to large. But the patriotic spirit did not compensate for the artistic shortcomings of these works. There seemed to be a flame of hysteria in everyone's eyes. But all this meant nothing to me. My father walked beside me, turning away from the cold wind as I did. I could feel the pain in my lower abdomen. The wound was still fresh and sore. The stitches had shined only a few days ago. I wanted to enlist the day after Pearl Harbor, but the medical board insisted I get circumcised. It cost a hundred dollars, though I'm still not sure if I paid the doctor or not but I do know that few young men at that fateful time went to war marked in this way. We crossed the Jersey Meadows and reached the ferry which carried us across the Hudson to the business part of New York. Breakfast at home was forgotten. Mother was up before dark. She did not shed a tear. Our farewell could not be called heartbreaking, nor was there a hint of courage, bravery and determination in it. None of these words fully describe what actually happened. Starting from home, like so much else in this war, was the origin of heroism. My mother walked me to the door, looked at me with sad, wistful eyes and said, God bless you, Rash. And then there was a silent journey across the meadows and an equally silent farewell in front of the massive door of Number 90 Church Street. My father hugged me quickly, then just as hastily turned away, hiding his face from me and left. The Irish doorman looked me over and smiled. I entered the building and became a Marine. The captain taking the oath of office made the ceremony extremely simple and shortened. We all raised our hands, then lowered our hands when he lowered his. When we were allowed to disperse, we guessed we had become Marines. Serge Gunny, who had become our shepherd, quickly set things straight. The juicy curses, which I had had yet to get used to, came out of his lips in a steady stream, as if he had practiced it all his life. Later on, I would come to know the true virtuosi of it. But then, driving us to Hoboken, to the train, he seemed to me inimitable. Nevertheless, he was kind and affectionate enough to mutter words of farewell to us as he put us on the train. He stood at the end of the car, a middle-aged man, trim and still quite graceful. But his grace was about to disappear, thanks to a rapidly growing belly. He wore a blue marine uniform with a green overcoat over it. The combination of blue and green had always struck me as a bit odd. But at that moment it was particularly jarring the bright, cheerful blue-blue colours of the marine uniform framed by the faded green. It's not going to be easy where you're going, the sergeant said. When you get to Paris Island, you'll realise how different it is from civilian life. You won't like it. You'll think your commanders want too much. You'll think they're all idiots. You'll think you've fallen in with some of the rudest and cruelest people in the world. I'm going to tell you one thing. You'll be wrong and to make your life easier. Listen to my words now. Do as you're told and keep your mouth shut. At the end, he couldn't help but grin. He knew he was saying the right, sensible thing, but he couldn't help smirking because he had no doubt we would ignore every word he said. Yes, Serge. Mmm. Someone shouted. Thank you, Serge. He turned around and walked away quickly. We called him Serge. Twenty-four hours later, we wouldn't even dare address a private first class without the imperative addition of Sir. But today, we had not yet parted with civilian life. We were wearing civilian clothes, and all around us were the shopping rows of Hoboken. Each of us humbly, silently disagreed with the plight of the private, confident that rank and file were not far off for him. The trip to Washington went smoothly and without adventure. But when we reached the capital and made a connection, it became busier. The other recruits had already arrived, and we were the last to arrive and the last to board the ancient wooden train, which was waiting for its passengers, puffing black smoke and spreading the smell of coal far and wide. It was to take us to South Carolina. Perhaps it was the pre-flood vehicle that put us in a good mood. It was a thrill to be in a real museum piece that also drove. Someone pretended to find a brass plaque under the seat, and we all laughed for a long time when we heard. This car is the property of the Philadelphia Museum of American History. We had light from a kerosene lamp and heat from a pot-bellied stove. There was blowing from every corner, the cracking and gnashing of wood on all sides, and the clattering of wheels sounded like lamentations. 
I liked this strange train very much. Comfort was left behind in Washington. Some of us even began to enjoy the hardships of the trip. And here some of the elusive mystique, the intangible mystique associated with the Marine Corps, must have had an effect. We had already begun to endure the hardships. That's what we were expecting. That's what we were going for. That's the thing about hardship. A man who overcomes hardship is always admired, and the one who has it easy is the least worthy of praise. Those who wished to sleep could have settled on the floor while the train, tapping its wheels, took us through Virginia and North Carolina. But there weren't many of them. Everyone was too excited. The singing and talking didn't stop for a minute. The guy sitting next to me, a handsome blonde guy from South Jersey, turned out to have a beautiful voice. He sang several songs by himself, and under the influence of the New York Irish in our midst, he was soon singing long Irish ballads. Across the aisle sat another fellow, whom I will call Armadillo because of his thin, thin face. He was from New York and had attended college there. Since few of the people gathered went to college, a small literary salon formed around him pretty quickly. Armadillo's group was no match for another circle gathered a little farther back in the wagon. Its centre was a tall, smiling, red-haired young man. The red-head had been a baseball letterman for the set, Louis Cardinals, and had somehow made a great name for himself on the polo grounds against the great Carl Hubble. There were no celebrities in our group. It was made up of ordinary people like me, so we also succumbed to Red's influence. How could it be otherwise? He was so different from us. He had a wonderful life, and he could easily socialise with people who were always the idols of his new comrades. So Red was approached about everything from pitchers' uniforms to the Japanese general staff. What do you think, Red? What's going to happen on Paris Island? Do you think, Red? The Japanese are really as tough as they say in the papers. That's the weakness of Americans. Success becomes a sign of wisdom in their eyes. And they listen to scientists rant about civil liberties, comedians and actresses have political debates, and athletes teach what kind of cigarettes to smoke. But Red suited his position. It was clear that in his case it was the numerous travels and newspaper headlines that made the difference. He certainly knew how to hold his own better than the rest of us. But even Red's resourcefulness failed when we arrived at Paris Island. From the railroad station, we were driven in a truck. As we climbed out of the back of the truck and lined up in front of a squat red brick building, we heard the classic greeting. Boys, said the sergeant who was to be our instructor, I want to tell you something. Give your hearts to Jesus, because your asses belong to me. Then he made a few sarcastic remarks about our pathetic civilian clothes and took us to the mess hall. There we were given sausage and lima beans. I'd never tasted lima beans before, but I ate them. It was cold. The group that came from New York broke up the first day on Paris Island. I never saw the blonde guy with the beautiful voice again, and neither did many of the others. Sixty men extracted from the several hundred who had arrived on the prehistoric train became one of the training platoons. We were assigned a number and placed under the command of the very sergeant who greeted us with a welcoming speech. Sergeant Riven was a southerner and despised northerners. But it's not to say that he favoured the southerners. He was just less sarcastic about them. He was very large, about a hundred and ninety and a few hundred pounds. But on top of that, he had a voice. His voice pulsed with restrained power as he counted off the rhythm, driving us from the administration building to the housing building and back again. It whipped us like a rod, making us freeze with fear. Only in the Marine Corps could the traditional 3-4 Nalivo, lengthened by the southern way of stretching words, sound like a magic spell. No one has ever pronounced this set of sounds better than our sergeant. For this reason, and also because of the sergeant's extraordinary love of endless shape-shifting, I can only remember him marching beside us, back straight, arms moving vigorously, fists clenched, head thrown back, and a thunderous voice saying, 3-4 I yield VO. Sergeant Review led us in a line to the intendant's office. It was there that we got rid of all remnants of our own individuality. It is the intendant who makes soldiers, sailors, and marines. In their presence, we have to undress. By getting rid of every article of clothing, one loses some characteristic trait. The loss of clothing marks the quiet death of all the characteristics of your personality. I take off my socks, and gone is the penchant for stripes and watches and checks and even solid food. Last to go is the habit of combining purple socks and a brown tie. My socks from now on will always be brown. They will not be kinked or short or holy. 
they will be brown, and one more thing, they will be clean. The same will happen with all the rest of your clothes, until you find yourself naked in the semi-darkness of an intendant's warehouse, trying your best to cope with embarrassment. Somewhere deep inside us, psychiatrists call it the subconscious E, there was still a human spark. It never completely disappears. Its strength or degree of disuse is proportional to the number of kilometers separating a person from the camp. Naked and trembling, a man is defenseless before the intendant. Character clings to the clothes. He is torn off with them. Then the intendant circles you with a centimeter, followed by a waterfall of unfamiliar clothing, completing the process of washing away your individuality. It's as if a giant cornucopia has flipped over somewhere high above you and a rain of hats. Gloves, socks, boots, underwear, shirts, belts, pants and uniforms is raining down on your unfortunate head. When you emerge from beneath it all, it turns out that you are now just a number. The 351,391 USMCR. Twenty minutes earlier, there was a human being standing in your place surrounded by six dozen other living beings. But now instead there is now a number surrounded by 59 other numbers. Collectively they make up a training platoon, and individually they have no magnitude or significance. We have become all the same. That's how all Chinese seem to Europeans to have the same face, and it is, I suspect, mutual. So far we've still been saved by hair color and haircuts, but soon neither would be available. To be marched to the barber, there was a mocking shout. You'll be sorry. Its echo had not yet subsided, and the barber had already cut my hair. I think he made only four or five strokes with the hair clipper. That was the final touch. And I was a number packed in khaki and surrounded by craziness. I Thus began our stay on Paris Island. In the six weeks of training here, there was nothing logical. No pivot except for the feeding. Drill weapons training, lectures on military etiquette. When saluting, the right hand should touch the head at a 45 degree angle between the right ear and the eye. Lectures on naval jargon. From now on, floor, street and court are all decks. One should clean and polish one's weapons until they gleam and shave every day. Everything was mixed up, piled in a heap. What were we going to do? Salute the Japanese to death. No, I guess we'll blind them with polish. Or shave the bastards. Logic seemed to be on our side, and the Marines seemed like a big madhouse. We were put on the second floor of a large wooden barracks and kept there, except for a week or so at the firing range and going to Sunday masses. I only left the barracks on Sergeant Rivan's signal. We had no rights. No longer civilians, but not yet Marines. We felt exactly like St. Augustine's definition of time. I from the future which has not yet arrived to the present which is just beginning, back to the past which no longer exists. And always and everywhere in formation. We marched to the canteen and to the hospital, marched to clean weapons and household chores, marched to the site for formation training. Feet stamped step on the cement pavement, stomped on the tamped earth, stopped to the accompaniment of clashing butts banging. All around march left to right, knock, 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 forward, Right shoulder forward march, stump, 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 platoon, halt. Damn you guys. You want me to tell you what to bang with, or can you figure it out for yourselves? You're making too much noise. You want noise? You want blood? Let the blood make noise. Come on, march. It was maddening. That's how they taught us discipline. Except for us recruits, no one on Paris Island seemed to care about anything but discipline. We didn't talk about the war here and we didn't hear any gruesome stories about the Japanese killing everyone in their path. That was for later in New River. Everything but discipline was mocked here, whether it was piety or financial policy. The instructors were all of the same persuasive soldier type. Their worldview was somewhat akin to the sensationalists who believe that if a thing can't be eaten, drunk, or put to bed, then it doesn't exist. Discipline was everything. It was an attitude that could not be made natural to people coming in from the civilian world, but it could not be ignored to make these civilians less vulnerable. Its Sergeant Revune was extremely strict. He disciplined us in the traditional ways. One ordered us to clean the latrine with a toothbrush, another ordered us to sleep with a gun that the unfortunate man had dropped before, or invented even more subtle punishments. But he valued drill above all else. Once, when I lost my step, he grabbed me by the ear. Admittedly, I am not tall, but I am far from light, and yet the sergeant almost lifted me off the ground by my ear. Lucky, he said, 
If you keep walking out of step, we'll both end up in the hospital, where we'll have to surgically separate my leg from your ass. Howler prided himself on the fact that while he could drive his charges to exhaustion in the hot South Carolina sun, he never made them march in the rain. A splendid concession, but there were instructors who not only made their men do drill training under waterfalls falling from the sky, but took genuine pleasure in the vicissitudes to which the unfortunates might be subjected. One, for example, made his platoon march in formation to the ocean shore. His thunderous voice counting down the beat sounded particularly impressive. If there was confusion at the water's edge, if men lost their step and broke formation, he would become furious. Mm. Who the hell do you think you are? Don't forget you're just a bunch of pathetic, good-for-nothing recruits who told you to stop. I give the orders here and no one stops until I say so. If the men went into the water without stopping, he would let them go in knee-deep or a little deeper, but so that the water did not reach the rifles hanging over their shoulders. Then he would grin contentedly and, pretending to be furious, you dumb back, you mistakes of your mother's. Get your silly asses out of the water at once. Turning around, he smoked angrily and said to Paris Island, Who's got the dumbest platoon on this island? Me, as always. It's a bunch of morons. Most of the sergeants were not cruel, and they were by no means sadistic. They believed they were doing the right thing by treating us harshly, but only to make us harsh. Only once did I encounter an act of cruelty. One of the recruits could not learn to march without lowering his eyes. Sergeant Rivan yelled so hard he almost tore his voice, but it was no use. Then he came up with a rather cruel remedy. He fixed the bayonet so that the hilt was behind the belt of the unfortunate man, and the sharp tip rested on his throat, preventing him from lowering his head. After this, the lad was ordered to march. We looked at all this with rounded, frightened eyes. The boy took a few steps, then stumbled, and the sergeant stopped the torture. The wild, primal terror must have been transmitted from the recruit to the sergeant, and Rivan hurriedly untied the bayonet. I am sure that the sergeant himself remembered the incident for life. Unlike his victim, it was not the time to make lasting friendships. Everyone realized that our platoon would be disbanded as soon as the training period was over. Some would go to sea, others, most of them, would join the Marines in New River, some would stay on Paris Island, and the conditions under which we lived were rather peculiar. A barracks was a barracks and we had good neighborly relations, but not friendship. I had a lot of friends in the Marines, but I'll talk about that later. Right now it's about how Marines are made. It's a process of surrender, surrender. Every hour, every minute we had to give up another habit, some preference, make adjustments to ourself. Even in the canteen we continued to learn. Here we realized that the personal tastes of one particular person mean exactly nothing. I'd always suspected that I would not get better with porridge made of crushed corn. Once I tried it, I was convinced I was right, and to this day, I can't look at it. But quite often in the morning I had to eat it or stay hungry until noon. How often my stomach rumbled irritably without breakfast. Many of us had some idea of good table manners. A neighbor's sweaty hand suddenly in front of your nose didn't fit into that notion, nor did the way plates were passed to one end of the table and handed to the other. Those sitting at the head of the table ate to their heart's content, ignoring the indignant cries of those sitting in the middle and at the end. Some of us might have been annoyed by the knives on the table when we were given beans, or by the animalistic slurping noises made by certain members of our group, but we became less and less sensitive pretty quickly. Soon I stopped reacting to external stimuli. Just a certain intestinal radar regularly warned me that it was nearing mealtime, and thoughts about the rules of decency left us until better times. The hardest part of this surrender process was the complete inability to have any privacy. Everything was done in the open. Getting up, reading letters, writing letters, making bunks, washing, shaving, combing hair, emptying bowels. All this was done in full view of everyone and as the sergeant came up, even food parcels from home were taken possession of by the instructor. We were informed of the arrival of the parcels, that the instructor had tested them and found them quite suitable. What, does that surprise you? Do you think it is too much and affects the reputation of the United States Post Office? Ah, oh dear, let me ask you one question. Who do you think will win in a contest between the United States Post Office and the United States Marine Corps? If you were confused during the first few weeks on Paris Island, the firing range is where you have to pull yourself together. 
The howler chased us most of the way to the firing range, which was about eight kilometers, in close formation. We had heavy satchels hanging off our backs. Our marine gear was in our tents when we arrived. We complained bitterly about the heaviness of the burden, certain that we could have done without the heavy satchels, not even realizing that the day would come when we would long for them as an unaffordable luxury. Then more than ever the howler seemed carved from stone, straight as a spear relentlessly issuing commands in a powerful booming voice. Only at the end of the march he became a little hoarse, thus demonstrating that nothing human was alien to him. At the firing range we lived in tents, six people in each. Mine had a wooden floor. Most tents did not have such a comfort, so both I and my comrades appreciated this unexpected boon. Besides, we saw God's providence in the fact that we six New Yorkers and Bostonians were lodged together. The northern wheat was thus separated from the southern straw. But morning, a cold seaside morning, put an end to the seeming ideal. The Yankees' lauded composure proved to be riddled with mutinous, jubilant shouts that greeted the sight of our blue, quivering lips and the sound of loudly clanking teeth. Hey, Yanks, and we thought it was cold up north and you were used to it. Turns out it isn't. Wow, look at that. The big tough guy's lips are quivering. Howler liked it so much that he even lost his usual restraint for a while. That's for sure, he said authoritatively. As soon as you put your noses outside, your teeth start chattering. Damn it, I don't know what to do. Half an hour later, the sun was shining brightly, and we quickly realized what hell the sudden change in temperature could be. As newcomers to the shooting range, we were in for a not-so-pleasant surprise. There was a kind of bridge where people used to sit, with the lower parts of their bodies overhanging a rusty sloping chute where the fresh water flowed. Fortunately, I was not among those who were sitting on the bridges at the time, so I watched the events unfold from the sidelines. One of the old-timers set fire to a pile of crumpled, rolled up old newspapers and threw it into the water. The blazing torch floated downstream. Surprised and indignant shrieks greeted the burning ship as it floated leisurely beneath the very sensitive asses of my companions. Then there were many other things, but the first impression was the strongest, and all the time we stayed at the firing range, we approached the unfortunate chute not without fear. At the firing range we were inoculated. Sergeant Reven, as always in formation, led us to the dispensary, in front of the door of which we saw half a dozen members of the platoon that had come before us standing or lying on the grass, depending on the degree of nausea that overcame them. Thus we got an idea of what to expect. Inoculation in the army is a totally inhumane process. It's like putting a man through a meat grinder. The military orderly stood in two rows opposite each other, but slightly offset so that the two health workers would not face each other. And we walked down this lively corridor. As we moved, each corpsman wiped the bare arm of the infantryman in front of him with a swab, reached back without looking, took a full syringe from the assistant, and then mercilessly plunged the needle into the soft flesh. It was a machine of moving bodies, reaching hands, the swift thrusts of the fiendish needle. We moved through the stage, got stuck for a moment, then started moving again. The machine had the productivity of an assembly line, and just like an assembly line, was alien to human nature. One of my tent neighbors, nicknamed the wrestler because of his immense strength, massive size and short career in the ring, didn't understand what was happening. He was standing in front of me, but he was so large that he was facing two orderlies at the same time, one on his right and one on his left. While the orderly on the right was wiping his right arm with a tampon and stabbing it, the orderly on the left was doing the same with the unfortunate man's left arm. The wrestler endured the two injections without even flinching, but then right in front of my eyes, and so quickly that I did not have time to say a word. Both orderlies made the usual movements with their hands, and without looking gave two more injections to Boritz, who had not had time to make a step. It was too much even for Bortz. Hey, how much have you injected me? One dose, asshole. Move forward. One? I got four. Yeah, right, and you're the base commander. I told you to move forward, you're holding everybody up. A. He's telling the truth, I intervened. He did get four doses. You both gave him two shots. The order lies were a little confused. Bortz's dull face expressed obvious annoyance, and I was too excited. They took Bortz under their arms and led him to the doctor, who, however, did not express any concern. 
He looked at the mountain of muscle and muscularity before him, and I... No, how are you feeling? I'm fine, but they pissed me off. Okay, I think you'll be all right. If you feel dizzy or nauseous, let me know. I hasten to inform you that Barrett's never felt any dizziness, and as for nausea, it had to be dealt with by the most impressionable of us, who happened to see Borette slaughtering a piece of meat fifteen minutes later. At the firing range I had my first opportunity to fully appreciate the Marine's ability to swear. There were isolated manifestations of this distinctive virtuoso skill in the barracks, but that was nothing compared to the all-encompassing profanity and blatant obscenity we witnessed on the firing range. There were sergeants who could not utter two sentences without inserting a swear word between them or calling curses upon someone's head. As we listened to them, we could not help shuddering, and the most religious among us began to blaze with anger, longing to claw at the throats of the blasphemers. Very soon we were to get used to it, and we ourselves began to sin in the same way. Later we realized that it was all bravado, not an offensive weapon, but at first we were shocked. How is it possible to create an entire art form out of ordinary curses, even the most ferocious ones? It wasn't a vicious blasphemy, an attempt to vilify, to smear. It was ordinary cursing, profanity, blasphemy, not too formidable, but surprisingly diverse. The first was always the word. An ugly word consisting of only four letters, which people in uniform had transformed into a separate part of the world of linguistics. It was a preposition, a hyphen, a hyperbole, a verb, a noun, an adjective, even perhaps a conjunction. It was applicable to food, fatigue, and metaphysics. It was used everywhere and meant nothing, inherently offensive. It was never used for its intended purpose. It crudely described sexual intercourse and was never used to actually describe it. Inferior, it meant sublime, ugly characterized beauty. The word was part of the terminology of the insubstantial, but you could hear it from priests and captains, privates first class and PhDs. After all, there was every reason to believe that if our conversation was overheard by an outsider with little knowledge of the English language, he could easily prove by simple calculation that this short word was definitely what we were fighting for. And the firing line, exasperated in COs, trying to make us more or less marksmen in an abbreviated training period, filled the air with swearing and cursing. Marines must be able to shoot from a standing, lying, and sitting position. Probably because the sitting position is the most difficult to shoot from. It was the most popular position on the Paris Island firing range. We were indoctrinated in all the necessary science for two days on the island's dam, bubbling dune sands. We sat in the sun while sand covered our hair, clogged our eyes, nose, and mouth. The sergeants didn't care about the sand as long as it didn't get on the greased metal parts of our rifles. There was no forgiveness for the unfortunate man who let it happen. The punishment was immediate. A heavy blow and a series of profanities shouted directly into the ear of the offender. To assume the correct sitting position, one had to be tortured by stretching oneself on the rack. The rifle had to be held in the left hand in its center of balance. But the left hand, threaded through the loop of the rifle belt, goes up the arm to the biceps, where it is incredibly tight. And when you sit cross-legged in Buddha pose, the butt of the gun is a few centimeters from your right shoulder. The problem is to get the butt comfortably positioned at your right shoulder so that you can rest your cheek on your right hand, look along the muzzle and shoot. After trying this trick for the first time, I realized that it was impossible unless a hinge was placed in my mid-back that would allow each side of my torso to pivot and lean forward. There's no other way, otherwise the belt would cut my left arm in half or my head would snap off, unable to withstand the strain of turning and stretching my neck. Though, of course, one could try to take a chance and aim with one hand, imagining that the hand in my hand is not a rifle, but a pistol. Fortunately, if that word is appropriate here, I wasn't the one making the decision. My problems? The sergeant asked graciously. His sugary sweet tone should have alerted me, but I took it for an unexpected glimmer of humanity. Yes, sir. It's okay, we'll help. I came to my senses, but it was too late. I'd been caught. All I could do was look at the sergeant with desperate, pleading eyes. All right, lad, you've got a firm grip on the rifle with your left hand. That's fine. Now use your right. Well, 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 it's hard, isn't it? Meanwhile, Sergeant Howler just sat on my right shoulder. I could have sworn I heard it crackle. I thought I was done for, but nothing really happened, 
except that my lone suffering shoulder stretched a little, so the torture had worked. My right shoulder did meet the butt of the gun, but my left arm remained intact. That's how I mastered an unfavorable shooting position. I had seen only one Japanese killed by a shot fired from such a position when the enemy was not firing. Still, one could only wonder how we had been taught to shoot during the few days we'd have been at the firing range, or rather, to teach the few who needed it. Most of us knew how to shoot, even, most surprisingly, the boys from the big cities. I don't know how and where in the vast concrete and steel expanse of our modern cities. These boys had managed to achieve such a high level of skill, but they did know how to shoot, and not badly. All Southerners could shoot and the guys who came from Georgia and Kentucky were the best. They silently endured the humiliation of the rifle belt while sitting in the sand dunes. But when we were issued combat gear, they treated such unreliable support with contempt. They would clamp the buttstock firmly under their chin and fire a shot. The instructors turned a blind eye. After all, there is no point in arguing with a shooter who always hits the bull's eye. I turned out to be one of those who had never smelled gunpowder. I'd never fired a rifle before, unless you count the 22 points I had accidentally knocked off at the fairgrounds shooting range. The 30 caliber Springfield seemed like a real gun to me. I arrived at the range for the first time with two magazines of five rounds each and a stern warning of load and lock from the sergeant. I felt like a small animal about to be run over by an automobile. Then the dreaded words came to me, everybody ready on the line, fire, bang, bang, bang. It was my neighbor on my right who fired. The rumbling sound seemed to burst my eardrums. I jumped up and down in surprise, and in a moment everything around me was mixed, merged into a single cacophony rumbling on all sides. Second more, and my Springfield's voice joined it. Firing, ejection, reloading. Ten shots took a few seconds. Then there was silence, and with it came a strange ringing in my ears. It's still ringing in them to this day. It took me a little while to get over my shyness and start enjoying shooting. Of course, there were some mistakes that all beginners make. I shot at a different target, missed the bullseye, and didn't take into account wind drift. But I learned quickly, and when the day of scoring shooting came, I had no doubt that I would get the instructor's badge. This badge could well be equal to a medal for bravery. It also meant an extra $5 a month, which is a lot of money when you get $21. The day of our scoring shoot. In other words, the day when the results we would show would become official and qualifications would be determined by them was very windy and brutally cold. I remember the ominous, oppressive atmosphere and how I desperately wished I was closer to the fire around which the sergeants were gathered, smoking cigarettes and portraying a cheerfulness that I'm sure no one could feel. All day long my eyes were terribly watery. When we were firing at 500 meters, I could barely see the target. The results were, to put it bluntly, pathetic. I didn't get any qualifications at all. A few people got marksman badges. Two or three snipers were identified. No one got the instructor's badge. But after shooting away, we became Marines. We should have learned some more techniques, such as bayonet and pistol shooting. But these skills were lower on the Marine Corps' value scale. The Marine's weapon of choice was the rifle. So as we pounded away on the sidewalk on the way to the barracks, we were extremely proud to have mastered the Springfield. Well, at least we tried to do it. We were now veterans. As we approached the barracks, we ran into a group of newly arrived recruits. They were still dressed in civilian clothes and seemed to us unkempt, disheveled, pathetic, like birds drenched in rain. So, as if obeying some instinct, we shouted in unison, You'll be sorry. Howler grinned contentedly. In five weeks, we had done all we could. There was still a week of training left, but the long awaited and welcome change had already happened. The most important thing about our transformation was not that our flesh had become more muscular, our arms harder, our eyes sharp. We changed spiritually. I became a Marine. That automatically elevated me above the wandering herds of other soldiers. I now spoke disparagingly of soldiers and sailors. I laughed harshly when a sergeant would sarcastically refer to West Point Tikak as the boys' school on the huts. I accepted as truth which could not be verified, stories of army and marine officers who refused to be promoted to the rank of officer and joined the marines as privates. I acquired a vast store of knowledge about the history of the corps and enjoyed telling anecdotes about the invincibility of marines who had been through fire and water. I became insufferable to everyone but the other marines. 
For the entire next week, we did almost nothing while waiting for our assignment. We had conversations solely about marine watches and outfits. They were waking dreams. In them, we all wore blue uniforms, drank unrestrained, danced, copulated, and played valor. Occasionally, the name New River would slip into conversation. Casually, like the name of the lousy sheep in the family. That was the name of the base where the 1st Marine Division was being formed. New River didn't wear blue uniforms. There were no girls and no dancing till you drop. There was just a lot of beer and endless swamps all around. The mention of New River always caused a painful, awkward pause in the conversation that lasted until the unpleasant impression was forgotten, buried under a wave of new and joyous assumptions. The day of departure came. We threw our marine gear into the trucks, dressed and assembled on the platform behind the barracks. We stood in the shadow of the balcony, a place that frankly did not conjure up pleasant associations. Once Rivoon had punished here an awkward rookie who had managed to drop his rifle on the march. The unfortunate man stood there in formation with rifle in hand from dawn to dusk and incessantly repeated, I'm a bad boy. I dropped my rifle. Now we stood in the same place waiting for orders. Rivan came, ordered us to stand in formation and repeat the techniques of formation training with weapons. We did them quite confidently. At ease, disperse. There's your trucks. We got in the back. Somebody even got brave enough to ask. Where are we going, Sergeant? New River. The trucks started up. Everybody was quiet. I remember how Rivan, who had seen us off, stood for a long time watching the cars drive away. I was shocked to see the sadness in his eyes. We arrived in New River Deep and very dark at night. From South Carolina we travelled by railroad. On the way we were well fed, as always on the train. We slept in our seats and our belongings were stowed on the top shelves. Only the rifles we kept with us. On arrival there was a lot of noise, shouting flashlight beams flickering around. We climbed out of the wagon and lined up on the platform. It was quite dark, and the shouting figures of sergeants and officers around us seemed like disembodied shadows. They were something otherworldly and had nothing to do with reality, until another ray caught one of the shadows out of the darkness. In the light of the flashlight, the shadow immediately took on flesh. In spite of the darkness, I had a lasting impression of the vastness of the surrounding space. Somewhere above my head, there was a gigantic vault of heaven, and all around there was a vast and absolutely flat plain, with only occasional dark buildings. We were led in a line to an oblong, brightly lighted house with a door at the other end. We stood at the entrance while the sergeant shouted our names. Nicky. I took a step, and the movement separated me from the men who had been my comrades for six weeks. I walked quickly into the lighted house. The man sitting at the table nodded without looking at me, indicating a chair. There were three or four other officers of the same kind in the room, receiving additions. He quickly asked question after question interested only in the answers and ignoring me completely. Name, number, rifle, number, and so on, in other words, dry details that in no way characterize the man as a person. What did you do in the civilian life? I worked for a newspaper as a sports columnist. That's good. First Division. Go straight ahead and tell the sergeant. Uh, that's how we were classified in the Marines. Superficial questioning. Short questions without much attention to the answers. Schoolboy, farmer, future scientific luminary, they were all just grain to the receiving mill, from which they went on to receive the same neat labels. First Division. No aptitude tests, no vocational aptitude tests. The First Marine Division was based on a single premise. A man came to fight. No one was interested in his professional competence in the civilian world. It might have been an insult to those vestiges of civilian self-respect that Paris Island just didn't have time to destroy. Oh, well, New River would take care of them. The only talent valued here was that of the infantry soldier, and the only tool was the rifle. Everything delicate and graceful died quickly here, like delicate gardeners in a dry desert. I felt the force of this attitude, and for the first time in my life I felt absolute submission to authority. Getting out of the hut, I mutter. First Division, addressing a bunch of sergeants standing nearby. One of them pointed with a flashlight toward a group of men tramping some distance away. I took a place among them. Other groups were forming nearby. Then, on command, I climbed into the truck. I was surrounded by my new comrades. The driver started the engine, and we drove down the broken road into the unknown. Dark huts floated by. 
Suddenly the truck stopped. We were home. My home was now Company H, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Regiment. Home was a cluster of machine guns and heavy mortars. Someone in this cheerful company decided that I would be a machine gunner. The rostering process in company he was no different than when we received our assignments the night before. The only difference was that we all passed through the barracks occupied by Captain Big Ura. He gave each of us a military look, rubbed his very military moustache thoughtfully with his finger, and asked each of us a few short questions. Then, grinning sceptically, he divided us into squads and put us in charge of sergeants just arriving from other regiments. They were coming from the 5th and 7th regiments, in whose ranks almost all the old men of the 1st Division fought. My regiment, the 1st, had been disbanded, but was reconstituted after Pearl Harbor. The 1st was in urgent need of non-commissioned officers, and most of those who arrived, judging by some nervousness, had not been promoted as long as they wanted to show. Their chevrons were too new, and some of them had not even had time to sew them on, and had hastily pinned them on their sleeves with pins. A few weeks earlier, all these corporals and privates of the first class had been ordinary privates. But in such hard times, experience, even a little, is still better than none. All vacancies had to be filled, and they were. But there were veteran NCOs in the first. They were the ones who were to train us, make us a fighting unit. From them we learned how to handle weapons. They taught us stamina and composure. They were the old guard. And we were the newcomers. The young volunteers who replaced the quiet warmths of home with the hardships of war for the next three years. These were my fellow soldiers of the 1st Marine Division. Barracks, fuel, beer. Around these three things, like around the Holy Trinity, centred our life on New River. Barracks were meant to protect us from precipitation, fuel from cold, and beer from boredom. And there is no sin in calling them sacra. They carried the sanctity of the land. When I think of New River... First of all, I remember the long barracks with the low roofs. I remember the massive stoves and how we used to sneak out of doors under the cover of night, buckets in hand, to steal some fuel from the barrels of other mouths, trying not to notice the shadows of other men, thieves like us. I will never forget the crates of beer cans standing in the middle of one of the barracks, how we emptied our pockets of every last cent to raise the necessary amount to buy this essential product, and then carried the heavy burden on our shoulders noisy and cheerful, because we had a heated dwelling ahead of us, and when the beer was in our stomachs, the world would belong to us alone. We were privates, which meant we knew no worries. Besides, I had three friends, Bigfoot, Chuckles, and Runner. I met Big Guy on my second day at New River. He had arrived two days earlier, and Captain Big Hurrah had made him his messenger. During the first week, while the organizational work was going on, his clothes were constantly covered with mud from the countless trips across the swamp between the captain's office and our barracks. I didn't like him at first. It seemed to me that, having become a sort of close confidant of the captain, he looked down on us. Besides, he behaved, in my opinion, too roughly. This broad-shouldered and somehow very massive young man with blue eyes and blonde, soft as soap hair, was mostly sullenly silent and opened his mouth only to spit out a short phrase like, Cap wants two men to bring the lieutenant's things. I was too inexperienced then to notice underneath the outward sullen gruffness, a guy as frightened as the rest of us. The unmoving face was only a facade, and the contemptuously lowered corners of the mouth were a hastily erected defence against the unknown. Time would pass, friendship would warm his frightened heart, and then his lips would curve in a different way. They would stretch into a joyous smile. It was easier with Hoshone. We became friends on the first day of rifle training, when we were introduced to the mysteries of the heavy, water-cooled 7.62mm machine gun. Our instructor, Corporal Glad Kalitsi, a young man from Georgia with a pleasant voice and sad eyes, turned the class into a competition between the squads to see which one could get their gun into action faster. Machine gunner Huhotun carried the tripod. I, number two, carried the machine gun itself, a metal nightmare weighing about 10 kilograms. On command, ho ho Toon dashed forward to the indicated point and quickly set up the tripod. I, panting, dragged behind him to insert the weapon's pin into the tripod's socket. We overtook the other calculations, which ho ho Toon was extremely pleased about. You're a great guy, Jersey. He snorted as I slid in beside him and set up the ammunition feed box. Let's show these bastards. That was what he was all about. A devilishly, fiercely gambling man. 
and he was also a desperate cursor, always mocking everything and everyone, but his good sense of humour robbed him of his aggressiveness and softened the impression of rudeness. He was stocky like Bigfoot and me, blonde like Bigfoot, but certainly prettier than Bigfoot with his sharp, even gruff facial features. The three of us. And later there was a fourth runner who had joined us at Onslow Beach, were not very tall, under five feet eighty, and solidly built. Such a build made it convenient to carry tripods and guns as well as the barrels and base plates that fell to the mortarmen. In my opinion, the bulk of our training consisted precisely in carrying these weights. Rifle training and memorization of names. Know your weapon, know it down to the smallest detail, as well as its maker. Learn blindly or in the dark to disassemble and reassemble it, and to enumerate without stammering all the operations of its mechanism. And in addition, know the role of every man of the regiment, from the gunner to those unfortunate men who carry canisters of water and boxes of ammunition to supplement their rifles. It was all boring and oppressive, and the war seemed very far away from us. And it's so hard to concentrate and stay awake under the warm Carolina sun when the sergeant's voice chimes monotonous. Enemy approaching 550 meters. Readiness at 200, no 300, fire. Every hour there was a 10 minute break, during which we could smoke, chat or just gaze around. The big guy and I were clowns by nature. He loved to play our chief of staff, a major with a pompous gait and prim, almost cartoonish manners. No, so boys, said the big guy pacing back and forth in front of us, as the major usually did, let's learn the following. You don't have to think. Soldiers aren't allowed to think. By thinking, you weaken the fighting ability of your unit. Anyone caught doing so will be court-martialed. Soldiers in Company H who have brains must surrender them to the intendant immediately. There is a shortage of them in the officer corps. We used to sing a lot in those days. Neither Zorovayak nor I had a voice, by the way, and neither did I have a hearing, but we liked the process of singing very much. Unfortunately, we had no opportunity to enrich our repertoire with good songs. The war songs we were assiduously fed were completely impersonal and unmemorable. Neither words nor melody. Choruses like Let's Show the Japs that the Yankees are far from simple, or I sent a kiss to the ocean could hardly fill our hearts with the desire to kill or conquer anything. We sang them for a few days, after which we moved on to blat lyrics, finding them at least reckless. It's sad to go to war without having your own soul-stirring song. Something military patriotic like the Mountaineer, or something playful and sarcastic, like Sixpence by the British, could have made us realize that war is worth fighting. But we didn't have anything like that. We lived in advanced times and were too sophisticated for such unmodern tinsel. Military appeals and war songs seemed naive and superfluous in our rational world. We were well supplied with food for thought. Abstractions like the Four Freedoms. If that's not enough, sing military marches. If a man must live in the dirt, go hungry and risk his ass, he needs a reason why he must do all this. The result is not the reason. Without understanding the reason, we become testy. One need only look at Bill Muldin's drawings to realize how ballsy the men who fought in World War II became. We had to laugh at ourselves or else, caught in the middle of the mad mechanical carnage, we could go insane. We Marines were probably luckier than others, because in addition to the saving laughter, we had a Marine Corps cult following. No one ever forgot their affiliation with the Marine Corps. This was expressed in the emerald green of the uniforms, the fierce brushing of dark brown boots, the dashingly padded headgear of the NCUS and more. We remembered it at every lecture, every class. Sometimes a gunnery sergeant would interrupt the class and reminisce. No China, boys, that's right. Give me back my good old Shanghai. Nothing like this shithole. Barracks, good food. We even had plates. Freedom, blue uniforms. And now Chinese women love the Marines. They love Americans, and they don't pay attention to either Marines or sailors if there's a Marine around. That was service boy. And since the Marine is a volunteer, there is always a limit to his self-interest. He can whine and complain until he gets the answer. You wanted this, didn't you? Only once did I hear of an opportunity to meet our equals. At a practice session with bayonets, two rows of men stood opposite each other. We held rifles with bayonets fixed, but in scabbards. At the command, the two ranks came together. The sergeant, however, was not satisfied, probably because of our obvious unwillingness to gut each other. He ordered us to stop practicing and grab someone's rifle. Nunge. Parry. 
Lunge, he shouted, showing us how to do the moves. Lunge, parry, lunge again, punch, bayonet in the stomach. Damn it, boys. You will face the virtuosos of bayonet attack. You'll be fighting an opponent who loves cold steel. Remember what they did in the Philippines. What did they do in Hong Kong? You guys should learn how to use a bayonet, unless, of course, you want some yellow-faced bastard to gut you. It was discouraging. Even the other sergeants were blushing for him. I couldn't help but compare this sergeant and his deliberate rage to the methods of our instructors on Paris Island. They would order us to go at ourselves with bayonet drawn and playfully disarm us. Poor fellow. He thought that to teach was to frighten. He still stands before my eyes as he was at Guadalcan. Deep-set eyes full of fear, slumped cheeks, trembling veins. Fortunately, someone showed mercy and he was evacuated. I never heard from him again. No one else spoke of our imperfection and the superiority of the enemy. Once we finished training, we would line up and march home. Up to the point where it was half a kilometre to the barracks, we walked in a marching column. Rifles on our shoulders, we could even slouch if we wanted to. You don't have to keep up. We walked home, laughing and chatting, cheerfully echoing each other in the rapidly thickening darkness. Every half a kilometre before the base, there was a loud voice of the commander. A R O T A attention, and then we were marching in formation, so we approached accompanied by rapidly lengthening shadows to the barracks where Company N was stationed, dirty and dreaming of a sip of water. We walked along our street, typing step, like a garrison on parade. Half an hour later, after a shower and a hot meal, we would come to life. Someone was checking for fuel. Hey, Lucky, we're low on fuel. I'd grab a bucket and go fishing. Iggy and Chuckles would go for a beer. They'd be back pretty soon. The gentleman or somebody else was sweeping the floor of the cabin. Stump was probably helping. Stump, a short, somewhat bull-like country boy from Pennsylvania, didn't drink or smoke. At least not then. But he liked to collapse on the floor and roll the dice, or lay out the cards, or just thoroughly oil his hair. For Stump. That's what life was all at. Dice, cards, hair oil. What did we talk about in the evenings? There was a lot of market gossip rumours about supplies, future assignments, scolding about food, grinding the bones of sergeants and officers. And of course, there was no shortage of sex talk. Everyone as one exaggerated their success with women, especially the youngest of us. I suppose our conversations were mostly boring, at least that's how it seems to me today. They were boring, no doubt, but they felt like home. We were becoming a family. Company H was a kind of clan, a tribe, with branches, families, like real families. Each branch was different from each other because its members were completely different. They were nothing like the wards described in so many books. In cross-section, consisting of the Catholic, the Protestant and the Jew, the rich guy, the middleman and the poor guy, the genius and the dumbass. That unlikely cocktail as palatable to the American palate as a national soccer team. There was no racial or religious strife in my ward. We didn't have what are called internal conflicts. That's usually a figment of the imagination of people who have never fought a war. Only fat rear guards can afford such hemorrhoids as a luxury. Obviously, we couldn't do without disagreements. But we translated everything that displeased us into a general dislike for officers and discipline, and later for the two enemies confronting us in the Pacific, the jungle and the Japanese. The unit as a sociological unit, Viewed under the microscope of the modern novelist, is generally unreal. It is cold and devoid of spirit, and it has nothing to do with the squads I knew, which were unique and unlike each other as human beings. Our platoon was received by Sergeant Narrow-Faced. Lieutenant Plyosh, our commander, was expected only a few days later. In the meantime, Yuskalitsi was in command. He was older than me, if only by a few months, but he had been in the Marines for three years, so he was older by centuries. Okay, he said, and ran a quick hand through his long blonde hair, which he slicked back smoothly. His lean face was smoothly shaved, as it always was when he stood in front of the formation. We were moving toward the shore. The enlisted men, hmm, now the sergeants love that phrase. We'll leave tomorrow morning with full dress uniforms. Marine equipment will remain here under lock and key. Make sure you have your cutlery. Make sure you have everything you need to set up your tents. You better have enough pegs to pull the tents up or your asses will suffer significantly. All dismissals are cancelled. Having expressed our attitude to what was happening with a disgruntled murmur, we dispersed to the barracks. We had to pack up. 
And then, for the first time in a while, the officers began to have fun playing with the soldiers. Every hour, Narrow-Faced burst into the barracks and announced a new order, sometimes following the previous one, but more often contradicting it. No pegs for tents. Battalion chief Sai. Take marine equipment. Everybody got the stakes. Only Zorda Vyak, who seemed to have the natural calm contempt of a private for officers, refused to take part in the general frantic fuss. Whenever the rousing narrow face appeared on the doorstep with a new order, he rose from his bunk, listened to it with grim interest, then shrugged his shoulders in bewilderment and sat back down with a look of superiority at the commotion around him. No, big guy, I asked, aren't you going to pack? I'm all set, he said, pointing to a pile of socks, underwear, shaving cream, and other necessities. But they have to be packed. No need at all, Lecky. I'll pack it all up in the morning when they finally calmed down. Chuckles intervened. The distinctly cheerful note in his voice softened the reproach. You should hurry up. They'll test you, and you'll get a lot of trouble on your ass. You'll get a lip so far up your ass, you'll have to slingshot your food. The big guy yawned defiantly and stretched his mouth into a wide grin. He'd been watching us all night and sipping warm beer, two cans of which he'd stashed away the night before, not doubting that he'd be right in the end. And so it was. We packed our duffel bags only to immediately shake everything back out and put something out, obeying the next order. We twisted around like weather vents twitching in the gusty wind of orders blowing from officer country, but Biggie was right. In the morning came the final order from the battalion commander. He refrained from joking with the soldiers, and his order was different from all the others because it was official. We once again turned out our duffel bags, folded them again and loaded them on our backs. Now I don't remember exactly how much our bags weighed, I think about 10 kilograms, but even this showed the differences between people. Personally, I took with me the bare minimum, in other words, only what the regimental peak ordered. But people who were obsessed with cleanliness could hide a couple of extra bars of soap or a bottle of hair oil in a bag. Others preferred to stash a couple of cans of beans under their stuff, and still others just couldn't move anywhere without a weighty bundle of letters from home. A soldier's duffel bag is like a lady's purse, its contents reflecting the personality of the owner. I was very sad to see memorabilia in the duffel bags of dead Japanese. These smooth-faced little people have very strong kinship ties, and their duffel bags are full of cute things to remind them of their families and relatives. We line up in front of the barracks. The duffel bags behind our backs pleasantly pulled back our shoulders. My forward march. And we went to the shore. Apparently, we walked about 15 kilometers. Not too much for veterans, but for us, then it was a huge distance. We marched through a pine forest on a dusty road, so narrow that even a jeep could hardly pass on it. The whole battalion was on the march, and my squad was squeezed in the very center of the column. Clouds of red dust were rising above us. My helmet, annoying me to no end, was hanging behind me and banging against the machine gun, which was pulling away from my shoulder. If I hung it forward, it would start dancing a crazy dance right in front of my eyes. After two kilometers, I vowed not to take another sip from the flask. I had no idea how far I had to walk, and my pants were already soaked with sweat, soaked with moisture. They had changed from emerald green to a much darker color. On the first kilometer, we were still talking animatedly with each other, joking. Someone even sang. Now only the birds sang, and from our side came only the heavy footsteps, the clinking of flasks, the creaking of leather straps, and the occasional hoarse swearing. Every hour, we were given a ten-minute respite. On command, we would roll to the side of the road, and during those precious minutes, we would rest, leaning heavily against our duffel bags. Each time, I pushed my hands under the straps that cut into my body, and tried to massage my aching shoulders. Almost everyone was smoking. My mouth was desperately dry, and my swollen tongue could no longer fit, so I would wet it lightly with a sip of the delicious moisture from the flask, and then, what an idiot. I dried it again with a puff of stinking smoke, but it was a delight to lie by the side of the road, for ten minutes parting with tension and pain, inhaling tobacco smoke. The latter was a dubious pleasure, but I realized that only now. And then the command sounded a gee. Stand up. This meant that I had to quickly pull myself together and get to my feet. Swearing and spitting, cursing everyone and everything, we stood up, and the torture of walking began again. So we reached the place where the Higgip's boats were waiting for us. 
Here the road bumped into one of the canals that cut across this part of North Carolina, part of the inland water system. It seemed alive, this water maze twisting and pretzels on the way to the sea. We climbed into the boats and sat in silence, heads just above the planking, helmets on our laps. No sooner had the boat started moving than the guy to my left was thrown out of his seat. It was Junior, a small, skinny kid obviously too shy and timid for a marine. He'd come from New York and apparently wasn't a sailor. He didn't care whether it was windward or leeward. So he started throwing up on the windward side. Everything his stomach spewed out flew at us in viscous, stinking spray. The curses that rained down on Junior's head couldn't drown out the shrill cries of the seagulls swooping over our heads. Hmm, couldn't you use your helmet? Grinned the big guy. Well, Junior, what do you think it's... But by this time, a lot of people were getting sick of people using their helmets for their intended purpose. Poor Junior smiled timidly, clearly very pleased that he was not the only offender. When we went out to sea and began to rise rhythmically on the crests of the will, and then fall into deep troughs, half of the personnel, to the delight of the bosun, gave the sea the contents of their stomachs. The endless ups and downs became unbearable. The ocean tossed us up and dropped us down again, and all the while the bosun stood at the helm, impassive and cold-blooded as a snake, probably anticipating how he would tell the other mop masters how the newly minted marines had survived their first encounter with the Great Salt Sea. We circled the sea. I know now that I was waiting for the order to move towards shore, and what was to be our first amphibious operation. When the order came, the engines roared to life. The bows of our watercraft buried themselves in the water, and they seemed to go into horizontal flight. Thank God the rocking had stopped. Let's land. The boats formed a line of attack. Cool spray flew into my heated face. At first we heard nothing but the roar of the engines. Then we felt a sudden jolt, and heard the sharp scraping sound of the keel moving across the sand. We had arrived. Passage in, get up and overboard. I raised my rifle high, grasped the planking, and jumped into the water, which was about knee-deep. But under the weight of the gun and equipment I could not stand on my feet, and almost fell to all fours. As a result, I was soaking wet. Now the weight of the gear was added to the weight of the water. Get down. We obeyed the order. When we rose to our feet, having worked our weapons against an imaginary enemy, we were pelted with sand like fillets in flour. Having sweated on the crossing, we had already rubbed the moving parts of our flesh. Then salt from the seawater got into the wounds, adding to our thrill, and the ubiquitous sand completed the picture. The order came to line up and move to our new camp, which was about a mile away. As soon as we started on our way, the pain became unbearable every step. Every sharp movement of the arm created the effect of a razor sharp, cutting the flesh under the arms and between the yogas. After overcoming the indicated distance, we came to a rather dense pine forest. On one side of the road the vegetation was cut down and a clearing was formed. On it stood three pyramidal tents, one for the galley, one for the infirmary and one for the company commander. Here, as it was explained to us, was our new camp. While the territory was being divided into plots for platoons and squads, a cold rain fell. The first tents began to appear and not in neat, even rows, as it was customary before, but scattered, according to the new fashion for camouflage. We were exhausted to the extreme suffering from pain, hunger and cold. In such a state the process of breaking up the camp should have been a hard and joyless affair and should have dragged on indefinitely. But things turned out differently. None of us even said a bad word to the officers. Suddenly we felt an excitement that warmed us, making us forget for a while about the cold, empty stomachs and singing bones. Pretty soon we were all ready, limp and scattered about, gathering pine needles to spread down under our blankets. And what a bed! A dark green blanket on top, another underneath, and underneath it a scattering of pine needles on the ground. As I have already said, we worked very fast and cheerfully, good-naturedly scolding the underdogs who could not put up the tent. And the rain, that wet intruder, probably embarrassed at being the only gloomy crier in our merry company, quickly increased and turned into a downpour. When we had entrenched ourselves, in other words, dug deep trenches around the tents to keep the ground inside dry, the signal for supper sounded. The food was hot, so was the coffee. What else does a homeless vagrant need? It was getting late. In total darkness we finished our dinner and washed our metal cutlery. On the way to our tents we passed through the grounds of Company F, 
Here soldiers wandered around the tents, tripping over pegs, arousing the just anger of the old timers. Special lovers of profanity were machine gunners. From them you could hear very refined sayings with mention of relatives of everyone. But they, though I had to face more dirty swear words, are still unprintable. Thus, in rain, darkness, and a flood of swearing, ended our first day in the field. We joined the ranks of the Marines. The next day I met Runner for the first time. He'd only been in Biggie's squad for a few days, arriving later than the others. But I'd never met him. He was just coming out of Hotton's tent, laughing at some joke, and we bumped into each other. He nearly knocked me down. He, the runner, had very strong, well-developed legs, and when he moved forward with purpose, it was not worth getting in his way. He had been a long-distance runner since high school, I later learned, and a pretty good one at that, hence the powerful gait. The runner was a perfect fit for our company, like a glove stretched over his hand. His admiration for Hotun bordered on awe, but Hotun managed to handle it without offending his comrade. I suppose deep down he enjoyed the adoration of the dark-haired kid from Buffalo, who talked so intelligently about dancing and automobiles, which was quite unusual in Hotun's disorderly Louisville world. Our friendship grew, and it soon became clear that Hotun's word carried the most weight, if only because he could always count on runner's support. So Hotun became the leader of the four of us, something neither big guy nor I had ever recognized, and only begun emphasized it with his deferential attitude. Wasn't it strange that in such a situation there was a need for a leader? But it did exist. Two guys, I suppose, don't need a leader, three already do, and four are so absolutely necessary. Otherwise, who would settle disagreements, plan important events, suggest places and times for fun, and generally maintain harmony? That was the beginning of our beautiful life here on the shore. We slept on the ground and our home was a piece of tarp but now we were beginning to feel proud of what we could manage. Under these conditions, the beautiful life just had to become noisy and often wild. Daytime training could not completely take away the vigor of body and spirit from young guys like us. Unless there were night assignments or company duty, we were free after supper until the morning rise. Sometimes we gathered around the fire, burned pine boughs, and took turns sipping from a bottle of maize vodka bought from the local moonshiners. The pine boughs burned with fragrant brightness, and the swallowed drink warmed us from the inside. We often sang or wrestled around the fire. Nearby, other boys lit other fires, around which other songs were sung, and the result was often a singing contest, usually ending in stubborn attempts to outshout each other. Sometimes an unfortunate possum would wander into the firelit circle, at the sight of which there would be an immediate commotion. Anything that came to hand would be thrown at the unfortunate animal, and eventually the poor thing would be put out of existence. After this, there was always someone who wished to demonstrate the sharpness of his bayonet and skinned the animal. The little carcass was usually burned in the flames of the fire, and only a few could boast of having had a chance to taste its meat. There were evenings when Zoroviak, Kokhotun, Runner and I, after eating, would go for a walk toward the highway, three kilometers from our camp. The sound of our brisk steps was drowned out by the thick layer of mud under our feet. Sometimes we walked in silence, mesmerized by the purple beauty of the night, and sometimes we fooled around, dancing in the viscous earth, bumping into each other, and shouting with the sole purpose of hearing the sounds of our own voices, which the darkness brought back to us. There were times when we walked in silence, only occasionally quietly exchanging a few words, reminiscing about home, or trying to imagine where we would be sent when our training was complete. The highway was halfway to other amusements. The highway was dotted with taverns, side by side. To get here was to cross into another world. One moment you were surrounded by the soft darkness, the smells of the forest and stomping, kneading mud with your boots on a country road, and the next moment you were standing on the side of a concrete road with cars and military equipment driving along it. On either side of you are roughly built shacks, shamelessly flaunting naked electric bulbs, and covering their most unsightly parts with ads for Coca-Cola and cigarettes. There were no girls here. Sex was further down the road in Morid City and New Bern, and here were the other amusements, drinking and fighting. You could still go to Greenville, but the Marines from shore rarely went there to greater risk of getting busted for uniform violations. Chuckles and I took a chance once and were rewarded with delicious hamburgers. A kind of symbol and traditional meeting place for the guys of our battalion was a green lantern. It stood on the road not far from our location, 
just at the point where the country road met the concrete road, as if slipping under it. This is where fights used to break out. Whenever you came to a green light, a fight was either baked, started, or expected. You could see the results the next morning on the faces of the guys lined up in front of the dispensary. I'll tell you how our first adventure took place. It was the end of the week. We had just returned to our huts, received our furloughs, and set out to meet civilization in full uniform. Our foursome marched briskly into Morid City. On the way we cheered ourselves up with hefty doses of liquor. We walked, for we could not afford the exorbitant cab fares, and it was almost never possible to stop for a hitchhiker. Tired of waving our hands uselessly on the roadside, we began to frequent the roadside taverns, and in one of them we found that we had almost no money left. So I suggested we steal a case of beer. They were stacked in plain sight at the back of the room. And idiots snorted chuckles. You'll never go for it anyway. Master can see our every move. No, I said. We'll go into the latrine. It's right next to the stack. The door opens inward. We'll crawl out of there and pull out one of the crates. He won't notice. The counter's in the way. We'll slip it right under his nose and when we get to the door we'll jump up and run. All right, said Hartoon with a snort. Everything went smoothly. We pulled out one of the boxes and crawled and carried it quietly to the door, unnoticed by the owner. We looked like two caterpillars connected by a case of beer. Quite a peculiar bundle. Only our recent physical training helped us to keep the heavy crate a few decimeters off the floor, so there was no danger that the owner would hear the crate being pushed on the floor. When we reached the door, we jumped to our feet, and with the crate securely in our grasp, sprinted out into the street, once again bound together by our common burden like Siamese twins. We were excited and intoxicated with success. The night air blew pleasantly over our heated faces as we raced to the highway and then across it, oblivious to the busy traffic. On the other side we set down the box, a little away from the curb and fell in beside it, choking with joyous laughter. A kind of hysteria happened to us. We were now each richer by six beers, and the bountiful night seemed endless. Our chucklehead headed back toward the road, and I stayed behind to take a piss. When I returned I noticed that my comrade was not alone. The man standing next to him noticing me said, Bring that damn box back. It was the owner? You carry it yourself. I laughed out loud. Then I saw him clutching a rifle in his hand. I said, bring it back, he said again, and waved the weapon threateningly. I thought he was going to shoot us, and then I gave up the bravado. I called Crestfallen for help, and we took the box and dragged it back across the road. The master followed, encouraging us with his gun. My face burned with shame. We staggered back to the tavern like men walking toward death. Eventually the box was put back in its place. Compassion is a trait not given to everyone. I'd even say it's a hidden talent. Turning around, we saw the owner walking toward the bar where Big Guy and Runner were sitting. No weapons were visible. He had somehow convinced all the customers that the failed robbery was just a funny joke. He opened four bottles of beer and slid them over to us. Here you go, boys, have a drink on me. We said we were sorry for what we did. He smirked. You're lucky. I have a good heart. When I saw you run off with that crate, my eyes went black. The last thing I wanted to do was shoot you right in your fleeing asses. Damn, you're lucky I changed my mind. We laughed and took a drink. He grinned again, terribly pleased that he'd handled us and could behave graciously, as befitted a victor. You could always get into trouble in these taverns, just as you could in the many cafes of New Burpee, Morid City and Wilmington. I say cafes, because that's what the owners called them, but they were hardly different from the more familiar taverns, except that they were located on city streets instead of highways and their walls were painted. There was another very important difference. There were girls here. They came from out of town and were not employees of the cafe. Perhaps the owners encouraged their presence somehow, gave them some kind of perks, but they had no official status. In the seaside towns of Newbury and Morid City, cafes were on every corner, cheap, cramped, the air full of cigarette smoke, and a jukebox that played such rousing music that it looked like it was about to dance. And there were girls. They sat at tables with marble countertops, covered with the circular imprints of soda glasses, overlaid with more recent, slightly smaller, but also circular imprints of beer bottles. The beer was clearly stronger than the soda. They sat at tables, sipping beer, smoking, giggling. 
their young bodies seemed eager to free themselves from their tight clothing. Some were too constantly in motion. Some were chewing gum, others were chatting and their eyes were working. Looking around, scrutinizing those sitting at the tables and walking along the aisles, they were hunting a searching, looking for a frankly reciprocal look. Having met such a look, the girl resolutely put out her cigarette, lazily stood up, adjusted her skirt and, swaying her hips, went to the right table. Then I think everything is clear. In New Bern, with its nice cafes, we usually went with Corporal Gladkalitsi. I changed my name to Potaskan. Let's go with you, Potaskan, to New Bern, he would announce, without pausing between words, and the whole phrase seemed to be one long word. Corporal Gladkolitsy married a girl he met in a cafe. An hour after the moment of meeting, he left for South Carolina in a car hired for the money I made by pawning the watch. He couldn't get married in New Bern on Saturday night, but he knew a judge in South Carolina who would perform the ceremony. After the wedding, he hurried back, spent a honeymoon in New Bern that lasted exactly one day and was in New River on Monday morning before he was even awakened. Smooth face never gave me my money back for the watch. I guess he thought it was a wedding present. Well, so be it. The intensity of the training increased markedly and layoffs became less frequent. We never went back to the base again. The days passed boringly because they were like two drops of water similar to each other. Saturdays and Sundays were no different from weekdays, with the only difference being that now every Sunday morning we were awakened by a forest fire. We could not, of course, assert that it was the Major who arranged them, but nevertheless we had no doubt about it. We understood that at heart he was not a malicious arsonist. He just could not bear the sight of soldiers resting peacefully, I say. There was no evidence of this, except that fires regularly occurred on Sunday mornings in about the same neighbourhood and in parts of the forest where there was no danger of their spread. We hastily loaded into trucks, calling all imaginable punishments on the Major's head and set out for the scene of the fire. We put out the fire by counter-fire, by digging trenches, and sometimes, if we had time, we trampled small fires and knocked down the fire with branches, preventing it from gaining strength. During one of these operations, my clothes caught fire. I was standing in the very centre of a smouldering, desperately smoking meadow. It was so hot that I could feel the scalding heat, even through the thick soles of my boots, thick socks and impressive calluses. I looked down and was horrified to see a smouldering trail slowly creeping up my left pant leg, about to burst into flames. I can't say I was too frightened, but still I shouldn't have lingered so I ran for the log fence, where the grass was tall and the ground was cool. I knew I couldn't put out the myriad smouldering molecules of my pants by patting them with my palms. I had to roll on the ground, get dirty. Where I stood, that was impossible. How I ran. I ran toward the fence and my friends, thinking I was mad with fear, rushed after me, calling me to stop in different voices. It was impossible to catch up with me, and after breaking every conceivable record, I was the first to finish, that is, to the fence, flew over it with a swallow, landing on my shoulder, and started rolling on the ground, grabbing handfuls of dirt and coating my smouldering pants and socks. By the time the guys on top of me sprinkled on top of me, I was no longer on fire. The first one to dive on me was Runner. Thank God I'd gotten an early start, or I'd never have been able to reach the coveted fence first. I don't want to think what would have happened if my friends had intercepted me in the centre of the hot, blazing meadow. I got a nasty burn on the inside of my shin, where my sock caught fire. It was sore for days and scarred me for life. The training was coming to an end. Days, days, endless dragging days, filled with sweat, aimless running. For some reason I was reminded of the senseless bustle of the French Revolution, exercising on the simulators, crawling up and down the rough, foul-smelling nets hanging from a tall wooden structure. This intricate structure, our Trojan horse, was arranged to represent the side of a ship. We were also always digging trenches. These holes in the ground were nicknamed foxholes in the Philippines. Digging, shoveling, shoveling out, so that when we hid, we were below the surface, dived into a fresh wound in the body of the earth and buried our faces in the soft soil. And around them crawled the frightened worms, as if alarmed by the haste of digging graves. Here were the bodies that filled them, seemingly still alive. That if we were not digging, then we were certainly marching. All day long on the march, the sun was heating the helmet, sweat was pouring out from under it, lingering briefly in the thick eyebrows. From there, pouring into the eyes, it continued on its way, 
covering the upper lip with small drops of moisture, flowed down to the chin, and from there it ran off onto the clothes. Meanwhile, the body continued to move, a grease-sweat-covered mechanism. Streams of sweat tickled irritatingly down her back, and when I touched my tongue to my upper lip, I could taste its salty flavour. There were all kinds of days, boring and cruel, tedious and exhausting. Days of lectures, shooting, inspections, cleaning tents, cleaning weapons, teaching politeness in war, friendship and enmity, and all this amidst birds singing in different voices. We learned to be indifferent to pain, rain, wet blankets, got our eyes grew sharper and our bodies stronger. And so it all came to an end. The preparations had come to an end. On the last day, the Secretary of the Navy came to see us from Washington. We were lined up in the shade on the bank of the drop. I don't remember now how long we waited for Knox, maybe an hour or two, but we felt quite comfortable standing around with nothing to do. We were resting. Suddenly a sharp signal came from the side of the canal. Shani braced ourselves. A shining boat was coming along the can. Flags flying, the nose haughtily asserted high up, the stern low and shifting, like a burly horse. It was the long-awaited superiors. The company commander approached the group of officials as it approached our formation to salute personally. He had already served up to that. He was left behind. He stood in front of us. A stocky and not young marine, sleeves in patches, many rights in general, a serious figure for any officer below colonel. The distinguished guests passed us by. An unpopular major among us was covering the rear. Just as he passed us, there came the clear voice of our old gunny, so powerful that all could hear it, that he We threw our rifles off our shoulders with relief. The Major's face turned purple, taking on the colour of a sunrise at sea. A shiver of mirth ran through the ranks. It could not be heard, but it could easily be felt. The Major quickened his stride, as if in a hurry to leave the cursed place. When old Gunny looked up to follow him, his face showed obvious satisfaction. Surprisingly, he was smiling like the Cheshire cat. He was all smiles. The high guest did not inspect us. At least if he did, it was not my company. I always assumed that in those desperate days he had come to New River just to make sure there were really people here, as if he secretly suspected that the 1st Marine Division, like many of our military units at the time, existed only on paper. That day marked the end of our shore training period. As soon as the arriving guests returned to their boat, we left camp. We were returning to the relative comforts of home, mess halls, and market stalls. It was impossible not to be glad of this. The war was still far away from us. The war was very far from us, and we did not even realize how important the visit of a high person was. Life was much easier at the base. The officers were much nicer. We were even given 62 hours leave from 4 o'clock on Friday to Monday morning. The surrounding towns instantly lost their appeal. We began to drive home. The highway starting just outside our unit location was jammed with taxicabs. On Friday nights they would pull up one after another, load up the marines and roaring depart. Usually the five of us would take a cab to Washington, D.C., which was about 500 kilometers away. From there it was a train ride to New York. Twenty dollars each for the driver, who took us to the station and on Sunday evening brought us back to the location of the unit. It is clear that the money for this was given by parents. A private receiving $21 a month could not afford such a luxury, nor could a private first class receiving a little more $26 a month. That was the rank I had risen to not too long ago. Cabs were expensive, but the fastest and most reliable way to travel. His railroad service was much slower and not very regular. The slightest glitch and you'd probably be declared an MZO on Monday morning. Sometimes one of us would take the wheel when the driver got tired of listening to our orders to push on. Then we would almost fly 145 or even 150 kilometers per hour, in general, at the speed that you can achieve by pressing the gas pedal to the floor. We usually arrived at Union Station in Washington around midnight, having left New River around six o'clock in the evening. The trains to New York were always crowded. Each car was sure to have a Texan or a poor Southerner with a banjo and a runny voice, and its quota of drunks sleeping off in the seats or right on the floor emotionless as floor rags. We stepped over them, making our way to the parlor car, where we were going to sit out the night and the distance, separating us from New York, until the greenish-gray dawn crept over the Jersey grasslands. All night long we were burned with impatience, which could only be quenched by whiskey. 
we couldn't even eat. On one of these short visits, my father took me to a famous English restaurant in the business part of town, where they served fish and game. For a long time, I had a half a fried pheasant on my plate, but I managed to swallow only a small piece, and I never realized whether it was tasty or not. But he drank beer glass after glass. This unfinished pheasant was often recalled to me two months later on Guadalcanal, when my stomach rumbled loudly with hunger. We were all in a state of eager anticipation. We were excited and could no longer relax. Thinking, much less introspection, was impossible in those days. We rarely talked about the war, only if it concerned us personally but never in the abstract. Hitler's ethics, the extermination of the Jews, the yellow perdition, all these were for discussion on the pages of the newspapers. We lived for the thrill, but not for the thrill of war. We needed the speeding cars, the dimly lit cafes, the booze that speeds up the blood flow through our veins, the softness of a cheek and the smooth, silky skin of a woman's leg. Nothing was allowed to last. Everything had to change instantly. We needed reality, not possibility in perspective. We could not be at rest, only in motion, only in change. We were like fleeing shadows, always flying somewhere, bodiless phantoms, doomed people, souls in hell. Soon the 62-hour furloughs were over. In mid-May 1942, I visited home for the last time. I was to be away from my family for more than three years. The 5th Marine Regiment departed earlier than we did. It left at night. When we woke up, we found an empty plaza, cleanly cleaned, as if no one had ever been there. Not even a cigarette butt or an empty beer can was left in the place that had been crowded yesterday. Clear. My first regiment followed the fifth a few weeks later. We packed our personal belongings carefully. All the duffel bags were labelled and loaded onto trucks. I didn't see mine until I was already back in the States after the war, from then on except for a brief pause in Australia. We were to live a very different life with the bare minimum in a satchel the size of a portable typewriter case. We were ordered to carry only weapons and a strictly limited number of personal items. It was especially emphasised. No alcohol. And the day before I had managed to get out to Jacksonville, where I emptied my pockets by purchasing two pints of whiskey, so the two flat bottles were in my satchel. They gave me a pleasant nudge in the back as I climbed into the train. We finished them that same night when the conductor, having made the beds, left and the Pullman carriage was plunged into darkness. Yes, yes, we rode in a Pullman wagon, and we had a conductor. We ate dinner in the dining car, and at night the conductor provided us with turkey sandwiches. It was a wonderful way to go to war, just like the Russian aristocrat in Warrior and Pete, who arrived at the front in an elegant carriage. And while he watched the Battle of Borodino from the hilltop, a servant served him tea from a silver samovar. We had a funny guide. He loved to tease a Texan who had recently arrived in our platoon. One day he overheard the Texan bragging once again and intervened. Uh, hey, he said excitedly, your Texas is so dry that even the rabbits there have to carry a lunch and drink box. The Texan immediately shut up, the boys sitting next to him laughed, and the satisfied conductor went on his way. The train was travelling across the vastness of America. The mood was excellent, and our hearts were singing with joy. We excitedly discussed the battle at Midway, which had just ended, and sincerely admired the Marines and pilots who had managed to stop the Japanese. When we got tired of talking about the war, we would play poker or just stare out the window, watching the peaceful scenery go by. For me, who had never travelled west of Pittsburgh, everything I saw outside the window was new, exciting and interesting. This was my country, which I was seeing for the first time. I tried very hard to memorise it, to soak it up. The majestic beauty of the mountains, the vastness of the plains, the richness of the fields. Now I no longer remember all the feelings that possessed me then, and I regret very much that I did not make any notes. Only a few details remain in my memory, so... Shadows of memories. I remember being terribly disappointed that we crossed the Mississippi at night, and I could not see it properly. All that remained was a vague sense of a large accumulation of water, and I also remembered the gentle beauty of the Ozarks the majestic forests verdant against a foyer of bright blue sky, the white river clear and straight as an arrow, the hill with a cross on top, but the Rocky Mountains made no impression. Where did the grandeur go? Maybe we were too close? They looked like vanilla ice cream cones covered in chocolate, but once we were higher up and could look around, there it was, the glorious west, and the Colorado River tearing through the gorge, 
The train climbed stubbornly upward. We didn't even notice that we had left Nevada and started a smooth descent down to California, towards the sea and the sun. San Francisco was shrouded in fog that hid the warm sun. We were on the coast, surrounded by the brown hills of Berkeley. A huge bay stretched out before us, resembling a water amphitheater. Seals played in it. I was 21 years old. I had seen the Golden Gate, and soon I was to find out what was beyond it. But not very soon. It wasn't until ten days later that we went beyond the Golden Gate. We were taken aboard the George F. Elliot. Now that was our ship. It was an African slave ship. We hated it. Every day we were allowed to go ashore. The peaceful voyage came to an end. All that remained were the last days, hours. We were desperately trying to make up for lost time. In San Francisco I saw nothing but cafes and bars. On my last request for money, my father sent me a hundred dollars. Therefore, I had the opportunity to visit not only dirty eateries, but also decent places. Although, who cares? They all merged into one, and I only remember the jukebox playing a dozen roses over and over again. Once in Chinatown, I was kicked out of a cafe. I shouldn't have jumped on stage with the girls singing, much less yelled, boo-oo-oo. That same night, I chased two Chinese away from a marine. I didn't see any knives but they must have had them because the guy's shirt was red with blood. He was lying right in the doorway, blocking the entrance to the cafe. I yelled at the owner, who was nonchalantly watching, but after my intervention still moved to the phone and called the police. After making sure of that, I left. All in all, the last ten days were similar to each other and could be described in just two words, lust and appetite. Eventually I had had enough. I felt like a ridden nag. San Francisco was over for me that night when I rode in a cab with Jaw, a freckled Georgia cracker, whose name also characterized his habit of talking endlessly and tediously about the Civil War. Jawbreaker got out of the car. The guard opened the gate. I stared into the driver's eyes, put three cents in his outstretched palm. The last money we had left. Buy yourself the best newspaper this town has to offer. With these words, I slipped out of the gate, and with as much speed as I could muster, raced toward my ship. One of the coins the cab driver threw at me hit me in the shoulder. Our ship put to sea on a cloudy June morning in 1942. Its clumsy grey carcass passed under the Golden Gate. I stood in the stern and watched the shore. An emigrant takes with him a handful of native soil. I wanted to take the memory with me. High above us, on the bridge, stood a guard. He waved at us for a long time. How I loved him for that, 